Good evening, Woodson Art Museum members, guests, and birds and art artists. I'm Kathy Foley, and it is a great pleasure to be standing here, especially amid the continued pandemic uncertainties. This gathering to properly recognize and celebrate 2020 master artist Timothy David Mayhew has been delayed precisely 365 days and 12 hours by my calculation. We're making up for that this evening. There is no doubt in my mind that each of us has been impacted in ways large and small by the coronavirus pandemic. Throughout the past 18 plus months, it has been abundantly clear that the power of art, art making, and art viewing has been essential in keeping us grounded as well as optimistic. Earlier today, we acknowledged our rooftop sculpture garden donors and partners, noting that great things are well worth the wait, as that project, like presenting the Master Medal to Timothy, was delayed a year. Happily, here we are, a small yet hearty and happy group of artists, and I thank you all for being here. We're joined by our valued members to enthusiastically and emphatically welcome Timothy officially to the ranks of Birds and Art Master Artists. To do that honor and formally introduce Timothy, I have the pleasure of introducing Pat Hogan. Timothy's longtime friend and trusted fellow outdoor adventurer. Timothy met Pat when he moved to the Smoky Mountains of Western North Carolina in 1981. They bonded over a shared interest in the great outdoors, Pat teaching Timothy the importance of proper backcountry gear to make the challenging conditions of nature more tolerable. Over a 40-year period, Pat and Timothy have enjoyed many great adventures, including three different nine-day backcountry trips to Denali and numerous week-long expedition kayak trips to Lake Powell and other Southwest lakes. Please welcome Pat Hogan. Thank, thank you very much. I, she took half my lecture right there. <laughs> At any rate, Tim's been my longtime adventure buddy. He's always ready for an adventure. And so uh, just, just last week, in fact, we were backpacking on the Continental Divide just out of Wolf Creek uh, Pass, 11,000 feet for a couple of nights, and uh, it was a blast. And I couldn't believe he took on that, that kind of a trip right immediately the week before this. And so that was a lot of fun. But we've uh, spent 40 years together just knocking around and having a great time and uh, learning from each other a lot and, uh, and just going on great trips. We've been on uh, multiple trips to Alaska and to uh, Lake Powell, as you mentioned, and, and uh, it's just been so much fun to uh, be on, on all these trips and learning so much. Each time we go on a trip, Tim's always rehearsing his lectures, his next uh, things he's researched and uh, bouncing all this stuff off of me and I've, I've learned so much about art in the process and uh, it's just been a fantastic uh, relationship in, in that way and uh, so at any rate we, um, we've been just uh, all over the country and, uh, and, and just had so much fun and I've learned so much from him and it's such, such a great honor to be here. It's, it, I know Tim is great, deeply honored to get this, to receive this award and uh, it's like a lifetime achievement award for him and uh, I am deeply honored to be here to present it to him and so
long time coming, but you know, it gave me extra time to rehearse. <laughs> 365 days is, is plenty. I yeah. Think. Um, so I I've been, always been taught that when you give a presentation, you should keep the title short and simple. So I am Timothy David. <laughs> However, and let me get the tool here. Um, that isn't the actual title of this this uh, talk. If, the longer title is more than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> so that should set the tone for this presentation. Um, I grew up in, a, in Michigan in an unusual place called St. Clair, Michigan. And where Lake Huron empties into the St. Clair River, there's a photo down below. And the St. Clair River, if you go down about 10 miles, that is where the town of St. Clair is. Now a lot of people don't know this about me, but I was born as a very young child. <laughs> and more importantly, I went to my archives to show you this is one of my early drawings, which proves beyond a doubt that you need to be born with talent. <laughs> Nothing is farther from the truth. The concept of being born with talent is an obstacle to anybody who wants to learn to be an artist. You, if you just have interest to do the work that it takes to learn art and all the subtleties therein, you can be an artist. And, and that's, you know, I mean, let's face it, that's how most people start to draw. And if you're a child, that's wonderful. And if you're an adult, you're embarrassed and you quit. But that's the way it is. Now, I went to the uh, St. Clair High School Saints, and I loved high school, perhaps for the wrong reasons. Uh, but, yeah, I was, I was actually a lineman on the football team and captain of the wrestling team. But I, that gave me, you know, kind of the, the strength to do what I do, to haul uh, a backpack up at 11,000 feet, you know, a week ago at my age. Um, I'm, I'm 39, <laughs> and then some. But one of the best things that ever happened to me, that in high school, there was this wonderful art teacher who was old school, who taught the basics of art, who taught two and three point perspective and how to work from life, Elaine Perrette. She's not around anymore, but I would go during my free time and she would find me with my nose pressed against the window. I wasn't even enrolled in the class. But she invited me in, and any time I had like free time, I could come in the class and I could work. And, you know, that was my freshman year. I was enrolled the next semester, and, and, and she taught me a lot. And I actually became a professional artist as a senior in high school and sold my first oil painting, uh, which you see down below, which was a still life. Of, uh, of all things onions and you know <laughs> but uh, but it was a great great foundation now full disclosure in case there's any badgers or Spartans or uh, heaven for begin Buckeyes in the crowd uh, <laughs> I, I, I attended uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor um, go blue what can I say um, however what I found out was that in the early 70s the emphasis in the art classes were kind of rooted in uh, abstract expressionism and, and I could learn how to throw paint at a canvas and you know not really what I was interested in but that's what I got so I, I did something else to finance my art career and I started I developed a reputation doing murals around uh, the campus for various doctors offices and other other things and, you know, in my defense, even though I borrowed heavily from Theodore Geisel and Walt Disney, this was before the stricter 1976 copyright laws. So <laughs> that's why I'm not in jail. <laughs> but probably one of the best things I did on campus was on uh, State Street. Here's a photo of Pizza Box. And if you notice to the far left, there's this ugly wall with all kinds of flyers posted on it. Well, the owner of Pizza Bob's, 
whose name wasn't Bob for, for some reason. But anyway, <laughs> he approached me and we worked out a deal. He said, is there something you can do with this wall that would stop this from happening? And I thought about it and we worked out a deal. So what I did is I painted a 16 foot tall head of Beethoven and it became a campus landmark. There's a picture of it you see in the Detroit Free Press Sunday Magazine. And it was actually uh, in a lot of journals. It was even in Time Magazine. I didn't get paid a dime for this. I got free meals for a year. And what student would not appreciate that? <laughs> well, I didn't feel really ready for the life as an artist or anything after uh, college. And so I went to graduate school in Detroit at Wayne State University. And there I found out that you could do advanced studies in how to throw paint at a canvas with your left hand. And, you know, <laughs> not what I was looking for, but Johann Sebastian Bach came to the rescue. You might wonder what that has to do with art. Well, the uh, Detroit Institute of Art I would pass by every day on my way from where I lived in downtown Detroit to campus, and they had a program they called Brunch with Bach. And so on Sunday morning, you could, for the barely the price of the museum uh, admission, sit down with a full brunch with members of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra doing a string quartet, and then I could wander the galleries. And there was one gallery that was my favorite. And that was a gallery where they rotated the drawings of the old masters. And I was mesmerized. I had never seen work like this in my life. They were using materials that, you know, as much as I tried, I could not find in any art store. And so I had to study things called natural red chalk or natural black chalk. And I was just, I mean, it became a, an obsession with me. And so, when I was done with my training, this slide represents the next five years of my obsession with trying to study the geology of how natural red chalk forms and where I might find it. And, it, and I went all over the country. I went to North Carolina, I went to Southern Arizona. But I had success in Northern Arizona. And what I found out was that the, the Diné, which we call the Navajo people, used this red substance in some of their ceremonies and, and in some cases they would eat it during um, this is a matriarchal society so the uh, when women came of age and if you think about it this is a source of iron which would be ideal for uh, women when they come of age but if you go out there you see that there's not a, a, a interstate highway system I mean, basically a road is just where you would see two tire marks and you go. And, and, you know, it took me about five years, but I finally found success in this area. And I would go out, you know, one time and I would, I would travel and, and the, there was a trading post I used to stop at. And when I stopped there, I, I noticed there was a, an elderly uh, Navajo gentleman sitting on the porch and he, he watched me get in my car, and, you know, which was pointed to go down the road. And, and he, he said to me, don't go. And I looked at him and I said, oh, what, what do you mean? He said, don't go, rains come, wash out road. And I was looking around, it was a typical blue sky day, no clouds or anything. And I'm going, well, you know, I, I'm here, I'm going to go. Well, an hour later, down the road, all of a sudden, these monsoonal rainstorms come out of the south. They wash out the road. I'm stuck in the mud, sleeping in the car all night, and kind of traveled out the next day to find somebody with a horse to pull me out. Well, I'm a quick learner. So <laughs> <laughs> the next time I passed this trading post, I stopped and I, I, I went up and I said, Yate Siche, which is the way of greeting a, a, a Navajo gentleman, which is, hello, my grandfather. And, and asked him, how's the weather? And he says, no problem, go, you're fine. And, and I would go, and, except this one time. And I'll never forget what he had to say. And I, so I stopped there and I, I said, how's the weather? He said, 
Don't know. Radio broke. <laughs> so, long story short, <laughs> I did discover a source of natural red chalk, and it was hard because in the literature it was described as several things that it was not. It was described as a red clay. It is not. It is specially formed. And then I had to figure out, how do you use it? And so I, I looked at old manuscripts to see how it was actually sawn into drawing sticks. And they actually sharpened it and held it in a reed that was split on the end. And if you look here, um, there's this string. You pull back the string, you can insert the chalk, and then you put the string down and it's locked in place and you can draw with it. And that was important. Well, that's how to, to make the drawing tool. But the next step is, how do you use it? And for that, I had to go and consult with my teachers, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael. And to do that, I went to the National Gallery of Art anytime I could. And, and I wasn't able to learn this in school, but I learned this after school, and these were important. Now, one thing I noticed, uh, from Raphael, this beautiful drawing of the horse, when you look closely at it, it's actually a sculpture. He was not studying a live uh, horse. He was studying one of the sculptures on the seven hills of Rome. And, and you can see here how there's, a, there's a, um, a joint here. And he actually had measurements of everything on that uh, sculpture. So this opened up a new revenue. I mean, I couldn't really afford to hire a model, but I certainly could find a good sculpture who would actually hold still long enough for me to draw. And, and it's important to work from three-dimensional objects. You can't get the three-dimensional aspects you need working from a flat photograph. And so this opened up a, a new avenue of what I could do. Um, in the mornings when I was at the National Gallery, I would make an appointment to study these old master drawings. And they were unframed. You're talking about sitting down with Leonardo's drawings right there. No glass, no nothing. And it was the most wonderful experience. And about the second time I was there, the, the curator of old master drawings, Dr. Margaret Griselli, came out and made a point to meet me because she was curious who on earth even knew to ask about natural red chalk um, and, and she wanted to know because you know that that was her her major she studied and wrote her th doctoral thesis on Bateau which was a French artist that used natural red chalk a lot well I, I told her you know I'm from the southwest and I had spent years to discover natural red chalk, and I was trying to learn how to use it. Well, she became very doubtful. She says, this hasn't been around in over two centuries. So, you know, and I said, well, next time I'll bring in a specimen in one of my drawings, which I did. So I brought in a piece of natural red chalk and one of the early drawings I did with it. Well, she looked at the chalk. She looked at the drawing. She looked at the chalk. Back and forth, and she said, well, you've ruined it. <laughs> and I thought, Oh my God, I, you know, I, th I thought it was a decent drawing. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand. We've been able to date drawings based on the use of natural red chalk to a certain period in time. We can't do that anymore. And I, you know, she's, she's been my mentor for, for years and probably has one of the largest private collections of my drawings. Um, so that was my curriculum. I filled just a few sketchbooks full of what I was studying in these sessions of not only looking at the drawings, but for instance, here is a 1994 sketchbook uh, page where I was copying line by line the exact strokes they were making, the directions of them. Uh, this is a Karachi drawing. And over here you have uh, Vateau, which we talked about. And so this is what is in all of those sketchbooks and how I learned how these materials were used because these are not like modern soft chalks. These were very hard and did linear drawing techniques. 
Um, I also, in the afternoon, went and looked at the paintings hanging on the walls. And what I wanted to do was study the design and the composition of the old masters. So anytime I came to a, a painting that I was drawn to for some unknown reason, I would reproduce that into my sketchbook. And of course, the, the king of composition is Vermeer. And if you look at how all these things lined up, for instance, how this line of the leg lined up with the corner and over through here, and how the line through the head lined up with here, this and the hand. And Vermeer was just a master of this. And it taught me the art of composition, which is very important and, and can, can, in my mind, elevate a painting to a work of art when you've done this extra step of, of how things should work. Well, I wasn't happy with just knowing about natural red chalk because they used other things. They used something called natural black chalk. Uh, this was talked about in the late 1300s by Cennino Cennini. And, and again, it was quarried from the ground and then used in a reed such as we talked about. And then this is one of my drawings that is actually in the collection of the National Gallery of Art. Uh, that was done with it. There was also two different kinds of white chalk and, and one of the ones that was used the earliest is called steatite and, and it couldn't be held in a reed because it's very slippery. It's in the soapstone family. And, and so it was held differently. It was actually held in a goose quill which was mounted on a wooden handle and glued in there and then you would draw with it. And that was, that was a change because if you put it in a reed, and I found this out the hard way, it just, with pressure, just keeps going inside the reed and slipping in, and pretty soon you don't have a point to draw with. Uh, but here is a drawing that combined the natural black chalk with the uh, natural white chalk, and it's at Harvard uh, University Art Museum. Uh, there was a very rare one that uh, artists used which was a natural yellow chalk. And this, this was very rare. And um, it was used similarly. You would saw it into drawing sticks. You could hold this in a reed. And you see a drawing here that's in the National Museum of Wildlife Art where I used it for all these lights. And uh, this uh, was a wonderful but difficult drawing medium to use. A lot of people don't realize this because we grew up in, in school using a, a fabricated number two graphite pencil. But graphite, for over 300 years, was one of the natural chalks. Pure forms of graphite were sawn into little drawing sticks and, and because it is just as slippery as steatite, it was held the same way in a goose quill mounted on a wooden handle. And I'm Glad to say that if you know somebody at this museum, you can see this drawing, which was done with this pure form of, of graphite. The other things, even older than the use of natural chalks, was what they called metal point. Um, they would draw with non-ferrous metals, softer metals like gold and silver and bronze. And to do that, you had to have um, a special preparation put on paper that made it slightly abrasive. And so when I would draw with the stylus of silver or gold or something like that, it, it would make dark lines on the paper which would stay there to become the lines of the drawing. And down here you see two different forms of silver point. The bottom one is called a silver stylus. You know, it was mentioned by Cennini in the late 1300s. But there was a silver shortage then, and so silver was quite expensive. So he, he described a second version where you take a, a brass or bronze rod and solder tips of silver. And he called this one the silver point, And that's where the name comes from. But the abrasive material that was described by several artists of this time frame is to take either bone or better yet antler and burn it until it was a fine white ash and use that to become part of the preparation. Um, I lived near the University of Arizona and I wasn't satisfied with just having these materials. 
I wanted to know how and why they worked. And so I worked with the university because they have a wonderful material science lab. And I was able to analyze. I would give them specimens and we could analyze the composition of, say, natural red chalk. We were able to do electron microscopic images of how they would act on paper. And if you see, these are the fibers of the paper. And all these little white, tiny, tiny particles are the natural red chalk, which have a positive to negative attraction to the paper. And so, basically, you can't erase it very easily. You would probably destroy the paper in the process. And so, you have to learn this mastery of touch where you make your lines quite light in the beginning, and only after you have everything established, you can do darker and darker lines. And, and that makes it, you know, a difficult medium to do. I, uh, I discovered the drawings of a German artist who actually came to this country to do most of his work, Karl Rungus. And when he was in his training in, in Germany, he would go to the Berlin Zoo and draw the animals. Well, if you ever try to draw an animal in the wild, they don't hold still very long. But if you go to the zoo, almost as good as drawing a sculpture, you can find these animals. And, and this style of drawing is called a sheet of studies. And basically, you, you find the animal who's holding still, and when they move, you start new one or detail. These are what the paws are like, or something like this. And this opened up a new avenue of study for me, because now I didn't have to find sculptures, and I could just go to a zoo where the animals were used to people being around and, and would tolerate that. Well, also in Arizona, if you've ever been there, is the Sonoran Desert Museum, which is a botanical garden, zoological um, a museum, where you could go and, and I could start drawing the animals. And one day I was drawing a coyote. Well, when I, when I do art, it's like mental gymnastics. It's like juggling two balls, and now you're juggling three balls. And when I get nine balls in the air, somebody invariably comes up and says, what you doing, you know? And they all fall to the ground, and you know, I try to be polite because I'm in a public space, but, but you know, I need to focus, I need to concentrate. Well, one day a, a very distinguished gentleman came up and he didn't say a word. He just sat there and watched me draw until I was done. And when I was done, he complimented me on the drawing and he reached in his backpack and said, do you mind if I join you? And I, you know, my sense of humor, I do have one. Um, I said, well, I don't know, are you any good? <laughs> well, this is how I met the great Bob Kuhn, who became a great friend and, and a mentor to me. And any time I went down to Tucson, we would get together and we'd draw animals. One time, he brought a hybrid wolf into his studio, and we drew that. And, you know, it was just, it was just wonderful. I wish he was still around, but he, he was a great friend. The other people I'm very grateful to are two wonderful landscape artists, Clyde Aspivig, who I studied with early on, and then he recommended that I study with Matt Smith. And what I learned was incredible. The human eye can see subtle changes in color and value that a camera cannot capture. And so I learned to uh, go out and be able to do small paintings off plain air, right on location. And those, I could match the colors because I was looking at it with my eyes. And I could bring these back to the studio and use those as, okay, I mix a color, it's that one, and now I can do a big painting. And so it's, it's a wonderful thing. But for me, an animal belongs in its landscape. And, and the two of them, uh, you know, belong together, and how to tie them together was what I was working on. Harvard University. Um, I, when I went through all of the drawings in the collection of the National Gallery twice, um, Dr. Gaselli recommended that I go to Harvard, and she introduced me. This is where she got her doctorate. 
And starting in about 1995, I had been invited to give a series of lectures every year. The last one was a virtual lecture in April of this year. And so we haven't missed one yet. And it, as you see here, they started small with just the curators and conservators who wanted to know more about these materials. And I was presenting data on the chemistry and the electron microscopic images. Because, let's face it, I can take my materials and make lines on paper and they can be cut up and put into an electron microscope, but you wouldn't want to do that with Raphael's drawings, for instance. And so this was a valuable resource. Well, over time, I started, you know, I used to have really nice curly brown hair. And, <laughs> and, and, and they started, I, don't, I didn't want to take it personal, but they, they started saying, well, you're going to publish this, aren't you? And, you know, thinking of, you know, I wouldn't be around that many more years or something. And so I said, well, you know, I never really, you know, this, I've been doing this for my own sake, and, and I'm happy to come here because when I do, you sit me down with all these drawings and I can study them. But I gave that a lot of thought, and so I, what I did is I, I began to publish this information, which is a lot of work. I mean, you know, you have to, you have to learn how to write, and <laughs> you know. Um, and so the first one I published was in 2010, and it was this uh, uh, natural black chalk. Everything I knew about natural black chalk, its history, when it was used. Uh, electron micrographic uh, images of how it was used, the, the chemistry of it. And then all of a sudden I'm being asked to do more and so I, I wrote another one about uh, natural white chalk. And I wasn't done. I mean here's the natural yellow chalk and if you look here's a specimen from my uh, collection. And more recently in 2014 where I started with natural red chalk. And, and of course, you see my favorite natural red chalk drawing on the cover. Um, so I thought, I'm a published you know, <laughs> author now. So where's Johnny Carson? Where's you know, <laughs> the invitations to the talk shows? Well, they didn't really arrive in the way I thought they would. What I got were invitations to lecture at different museums around the country. And, and that's been wonderful because every time I go there, they sit me down with their drawings and I can study them and get paid for it. And it's like, this is a wonderful gig. Um, and so that's been, you know, kind of a sideline of, of what you can do as an artist. Well, my philosophy is that uh, Cicero said that Art is born with observation and investigation of nature. Kind of wordy. I had a better way of saying it. But, but basically, you got to get out there. Uh, this is not the mission of man. Uh, but this is me. After many, many years of putting on every sweater and coat I own to get out there in the freezing cold and stand there, you know, waiting for the sun to rise. And then finally, doing a painting that I called, of, of snow geese, that I called Goose Down. Well, guess what I bought when this museum bought that painting? I have Goose Down now, and, and it's wonderful. But I had a better way of, you know, of stating this. You just can't sit in the studio and make this stuff up. You have to be out there. You have to be well-geared. And I can't emphasize the importance of proper footwear you know, depending on where you are. Well, here's how I draw in nature. I, you know, having a sketchbook is wonderful, but a lot of times they're awkward. There's two-sided, you open it, and there's a, a seam. And I like the papers that were handmade the way they were back in the days of the, the uh, old masters. And so what I will do is, these are my tools, sandwiched in between these boards of different sizes, are the papers themselves and sheets of uh, uh, protective materials um, like, like interleaving tissues to protect them. And then in this cigar holder, no I don't smoke cigars, but in that is my drawing tools. And when you open them up, you can take a sheet out 
and inserted under these uh, uh, bands, like bungee cord bands. And you see how all of the chalks are protected here. There's a razor for a sharpening room. And here is a typical sheet of studies where I drew this wonderful um, night heron. And, and as it moved around, I could start new drawings, um, very much like uh, Rungus would do. Well, in 2010, I took on an epic project. That was what I called the year of the trumpeter swans. And during the winter months, when it was snow was deep where the trumpeter swans lived, I spent a lot of time in Denver at the Museum of um, Natural History. And there I would do measured drawings. I had calipers measuring exactly the size of trumpeter swans and filled up sketchbooks with this material. And then I proceeded to go out and study the swans on several trips up to western Wyoming is where I found these swans. And, and I would do dozens and dozens of drawings and I'd select the, the better ones and then I'd bring them back and do paintings from them. I don't know if you'd recognize this one from 2010, it was in the exhibition here. And I'd do more drawings and, and pick out the better drawings and turn those into paintings. And this is my way of working, and it's based on the way the old masters worked. You study the composition of design through the drawings, and then you proceed to small paintings, more drawings, more small paintings, etc. Working your way through this, and once in a while you find this concept where you're going, oh my god, this one works. Let me try a painting with two in it, and see how I can compose those in the same way that Vermeer and other artists would. Well, one thing led to another. A wonderful invitation from the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles to work with them on a project of 19th century prints and drawings that they call Noir. And it was uh, a catalog for the exhibition was published and I wrote the chapter in there which covered the history of how charcoal went from being a medium that would not stay on the paper but could be erased with a feather to in the 19th century when they finally developed fixatives to allow charcoal to be its own drawing material and, and could not be erased once it was fixed. And in the exhibition was this drawing that I did of the Grand Teton. And this was done in this style. If you look, this is a piece of paper stretched on a frame, much in the way that a, a, a canvas for an oil painting would be stretched on a frame. And you see this yellowish material around the edges. In, in the 1840s, they developed um, a method of fixing charcoal drawings by painting on the back, and that's why it had to be stretched on the frame, a solution that would go through it and fix it from the front. If you painted it on the front, you'd just smear it. But this was the start of um, charcoal being able to use as a permanent medium. And by the 1860s, they actually started developing little atomizers to do that. So that's, that's a, actually a late development. Here. Okay, so here's my studio, and what you're seeing is this drawing, which is now a preparatory drawing for this large painting, which was here last year. I didn't get to see it. <laughs> Nobody got to see it. It was a bad year. But here, I actually took natural red chalk and natural white chalk and did the drawing on the linen and, and I don't stretch linen, I, I have it fixed to a, a, a surface so that it won't buckle and stretch with changes of temperature. And so it becomes more um, permanent. Uh, so you see the preparatory drawing and then you see this underdrawing, which is about to be um, painted over with various layers. Now, try not to get dizzy, but you're going to see various layers appear. And I took this with a cell phone, and, and, and so sometimes I moved a little left and right, so it'll, it'll, it'll move around a bit. But you can kind of see in this next sequence 
how you paint over this underlayer and how this painting came to be. And it's, it's Mark Rothko in style and takes many <coughs> layers and it takes days between layers to dry. Um, but this is, I mean, I'm giving away all my secrets. You don't want to do this tonight. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the shifts in movement is not that I, I restated it. But eventually you get this, this depth and luminosity that you can't really get by just simply um, mixing color. Uh, I got an invitation more recently to work with the Cleveland Museum of Art because of all these things I've been publishing. They mounted an exhibition of Michelangelo's drawings, which um, I was able to actually go to just before the lockdown from the pandemic. And in it, they had this educational box which contained all of my drawing tools um, to help ed educate the public. Um, this is going to be my last slide. I'm currently working with the Cleveland Museum on an exhibition that's going to come out in a couple of years on 19th century French drawings from their collection. And I just submitted another essay for that catalog on the use of natural graphite by artists. And so that, that will be coming out soon. But I'm going to stop here and let Kathy see. Did I do good? <laughs> <laughs>